Good morning to you all. I, first, I would li like to start uh, thanking the organizer of this important World Coffee Leaders Forum in its second edition. It's always a pleasure to be here again in Korea. Let me also say to the previous speaker that I really enjoy uh, looking and experiencing what has been done in, in Honduras. Very interesting presentation, and I'm looking forward to share with you what we have done in Colombia regarding rust disease, what we have learned, what we have implemented, and hopefully what we will continue to do in the future. So just a, a little bit of background of the Federation and Colombian Coffee. First, let me say that the Federation has been representing Colombia coffee growers in, in Asia for a long time. We have had that office in Japan, in Tokyo, where I'm based. I, we had a previous speaker, Ayash-san, from Japan. So we have been covering the, not only the, the Japanese market, but also the Asian markets for a long time. That's been a strategy that it's been paying off in terms of the volume and the volumes of coffee that we sell in the Asian markets. So first, let me start a little bit of a context regarding what is coffee for Colombia, or as we said in Colombia, Colombia equals coffee, coffee equals Colombia. As you can see from the map, there is coffee produced in the mountains. We have mountains all over the country, from the south of the country near the border of Ecuador to the top to the Caribbean Sea. We have a range of mountains where coffee is grown in our country. Land subject to be cultivated of coffee or coffee land, let's say, equals about 3.3 million hectares susceptible to be coffee to be grown in those in that area. Since there is different soils, different agroeconomical, agroecological conditions in the country, we have several different cup profiles, types of coffees. And generally speaking, also as you can see in the figure in the map, we have three main zones, the northern zone, central zone, the southern zone, each one of them with particular characteristics in the cup profile and in the type of uh, acidity, body, and consistency of the cup profiles in each one of those zones. So again, coffee is very important still for the economy in Colombia and the social fabric and the social stability in a developing country as Colombia. Coffee, actual coffee land, coffee brought, uh, cultivated lots of coffee equals almost one million hectares of coffee, 120,000 hectares of coffee are grown in Colombia. And also in the figures, in the economic figures, they are still very impressive. Uh, coffee constitutes 17% of the agricultural GDP, almost one third of the whole employment in the rural area, 31%. And we have almost 3 million people living out of coffee. Colombia is a country that, if I'm not mistaken, has similar figures in terms of population as Korea. We have 45 million people. And 3 million people still directly depend from coffee in Colombia. We have more than 560,000 families in all this area that depend on a daily basis their income from coffee. So, as you can see, still, like in Honduras, in many of the developing countries that grow coffee, the importance of coffee goes beyond economic factors, but is a, a very key aspect of the social stability in our country. Let's share with you a little bit of the type of coffee that we grow in Colombia. As you may already know, there is only one variety, one type of coffee, I mean, uh, grown in Colombia, that is Arabica. There is no a single uh, Robusta coffee tree in Colombia. There are a lot of discussions if this is good or bad, but the fact and the truth right now is that we have done it for quite a number of years in the strategy to be seen in the world as a premium coffee uh, using only Arabica beans. 
Another key characteristic for Colombian coffee is uh, the type of uh, mm, process that we do in the collection that of, the, of the beans. All of them are hand-picked, so that has a very simple, simple explanation. Since we do have a lot of mountains, I saw in the previous slide, there is no the possibility, and neither different from other countries, for example, of Brazil, that using machines, so we have to use, that's also a key important factor, we have to have people in the fields picking the cherry beans, that helps employment, of course, because we have to use coffee growers themselves to pick the, the green beans, the, the cherry beans, and obviously that also has an impact on the quality of the beans because they can be picked in the exact right time where the consistency is of the coffee is better. Also, Colombian coffee is grown in high altitude, as I show also in the previous slide, from 900 meters to 1,800 meters. And another key characteristic is that we use a wet harvest process using water after the uh, coffee beans are picked. In this pyramid I show something that is also very common in coffee growing countries, that is the scale of the operation. It's not surprising that the scale of the operation of the production in Colombia, it's by all means characterized by a small scale. As you can see in the pyramid, almost 61, a little bit less than 61% of the coffee farms in Colombia, they do have one or less, more, no more than one hectare. And we do only have farms that have more than 20 hectares, only 0.5% of the coffee production in Colombia is done by that large scale of operation. So of course, taking into account that, and if the coffee growers were to act alone without organizing, they would be not very well prepared to cope with the challenges of uh, agricultural prices cycles with the challenges that come with diseases, with globalization, with many factors that of course they need to unite and act together. So that's why they came, not recently, but fortunately for us, for the country and for the coffee growers themselves, many years ago, more than 85, 86 years ago, in 1927, the Colombian coffee growers unite themselves. Maybe it's one of the best examples of a, a strong institutionality that have lasted for decades, that has been subject to up and downs, but for the benefit of the coffee growers, we have a strong institution since that time with a very simple mission that is supporting the well-being of the Colombian coffee growers to an organization that has to be effective, democratic, and representative. Those are the key pillars of our organization. In order to consolidate this productive, productive and social development and the sustainability of the well of the coffee growers themselves, that sustainability has three pillars, the economic pillar, the environmental pillar and the social pillar. So all the actions that the Federation carries out in Colombia, they encompass those three pillars. So let's get a little bit more into the details of, of the subject that has, is the, the topic of this morning with you. Regarding the impact and the incidence of coffee rust disease in Colombia. In that graph, in this graph, we can see the Southern Oscillation Index is one of those indexes in, indexes. in this case is an Australian one that shows the appearance and the length of time of the different weather phenomena, in this case, the El Niño and La Niña, that as you may know, there are different scenarios depending on each one. And what we have seen lately since the 2000, since the middle of the 2000 decade, is that it comes and goes one or the other, and the length of each one of those periods, for example, this one lasted, La Niña, 24 months. So we have recently, in, in, in some years ago, different conditions and different weather pa patterns that, of course, 
have impacted the way that coffee is produced and the incidence of diseases. In this graph and in the two following graphs, you will see from the year 2008 to 2011, the percental change taking into account the historical levels in this case regarding rainfall in three experimental um, centers of Senicafe, of our research center in the south of the country in a town called Tambo, in the center of the country in Station, Station Naranjal, in Pueblo Bello in the north. So as we can see, of course, particularly in 2008, is very high levels above the historical levels of rain levels, in this case in both in, in the south, in the center, or in the north. That situation continues with ups, up and downs, and as you can see also in the graph, they are of course related to the El Niño and La Niña phenomena. But the same token, uh, at this, let's say they go hand by hand. With more rain, there is less sun. Of course, it's an uh, obvious impact. And also, the coffee trees, they, they do need certain amount of sun to obviously have better production. So in this case, we see the opposite. We have, from the historical levels of the amount of sun that the coffee trees get in Colombia, decreases from those levels, particularly in this period in 2008, also into the, at the end of 2010 and beginning of 2011. And also, not surprisingly, we have also temperatures that are below the historical levels. It's, it's a, it goes in, in a chain reaction. We have more rain, more humidity, less sun, and of course, lower temperatures. So these lower temperatures also cost and they impacted the production and the incidence of rust disease. Rust disease. So again, as you see, very, sim sorry, very similar of what, what happened with humidity and what happened with the sun, we have different scenarios, different spe specific variations. In this case, lower temperatures in these three stations of Senicafe. So we have, as we have heard before from the previous speaker, coffee rose disease is a very important disease in this case because it affects production very strongly. It's related, of course, that the way that the coffee rose disease works is attacks the coffee leaves and in, it impacts not only the current production but the years to come production. So some experiments that we have done in Senicafe in our research center in um, control conditions show that the incidence of coffee rose disease can affect up to 23, 25% of the production in a period of four, four years. As we also heard before, that can even go even higher when we have incidences of coffee rose disease more than 50%, 70%, of course, that, that is much more difficult. So what happened in Colombia? I don't have here the figures of 2008, but of course, the, in, the infection of coffee rust disease went very high from levels that were before around 10, 15, 20%, all the way to 40 and 35% in the year 2008, 2009, and 2010. And since that time, we had a, an alarm at this time in Colombia, so we needed to design and implement a new strategy to fight with rust disease that was successful. In this case, you can see the incidence went be, uh, to values much lower than the 35%. Those are some pictures just to show you the direct impact of the disease in Colombia. As you can see here, the leaves, they fall down, the coffee cherries are damaged, and of course, not only they, they are affected, the leaves, but they also fall down. So we have a, a lot of 
uh, unfortunately, coffee land in Colombia that look very similar to this for a long time that affected production. So as you can see here, the blue line is the historical levels, the average production until 2008. Generally speaking, Colombia produced around 10, 11, 12 million bags until the year 2008. And with this impact of coffee rose disease, you can see a very sharp decrease from year 2008 to that we, we reach around 12 million uh, bags of 60 kilo bags of coffee to be produced and exported. We went down very drastically to a little bit more than 7 million bags. So that, ha that causes, of course, a huge impact on Colombia. And we need it, that is the following uh, aspects of the presentation, we needed an, a strategy to cope with this lower production and the high infection of coffee rose disease in Colombia. This strategy ha had two pillars. First of all, to be able to control the areas that use non-resistant varieties and to stop the spreading of the disease. And the second strategy was to renew with new varieties of coffee that are resistant to coffee rust disease. So, so we needed to control first, not to let it spread, and also to change the coffee trees, especially in a very, in the most affected areas where coffee rust disease was present. Fortunately also, we have a worldwide recognized research center that is called CENICAFE in the heart of the coffee region in Colombia that has been working in these issues a long time ago. So CENICAFE works very closely with another institution in the umbrella of the Colombian coffee growers institutionality that is the Manuel Mejia Co Foundation. It is something similar of a coffee university. So those two centers, they work together with the technical assistance, with the extension service of the Federation, that we have more than 1,300 agronomists in the fields working together. So in this case, the, the first thing that we did was to update, update the, the research and the materials to teach the extension service members. So we trained them through an online course that lasted six weeks with this new strategy and the new technical details to be transferred to the coffee growers. It worked very well because we had a virtuous, virtuous cycle of the, that knowledge to be transferred and to be updated and renewed because the research center worked very closely with the extension service in Colombia. So the way that that knowledge was transferred transfer was very successful. Not only we have a strong extension service, but we do also use technologies like the internet, of course, virtual tools. We also have distributed, for example, tablets that the coffee growers have in their coffee farms, so they are able to uh, obtain access to these new training and technologies. Also, we carried out a lot of activities, training activities, and more than 400,000 coffee growers got and learned about the new techni techniques to combat, combat rust disease. Another key aspect of this strategy was to develop an early warning system for rust disease a very key asset that the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation has for many purposes is the existence of the coffee information system, or SICA in Spanish, in which the Federation, this, this system, has, for example, all the information regarding every single farm of coffee farm in Colombia, who is the owner, what type of coffee is grown, what has been the incidence in this case, for example, of diseases. So with this early warning system, what we achieved was to control somehow the spread of the disease, having been able to control it and to attack it very rapidly when there was 
levels that went beyond certain threshold. And the second pillar that I mentioned before was to develop and to use a new variety more resistant to coffee rust disease. So usually in Colombia, as you may know, we have different varieties of coffee. We have still Tipica in some areas of the country, Bourbon, Caturra, and the new variety that was developed by Senecafe is called Castillo. So that was the key, one of the key pillars of this strategy to combat coffee rust disease. Of course, it was a very hard challenge to cope because we needed not only a new variety that of course is resistant or is more resistant to these diseases, but also of course they have, it have, have to have some other characteristics. For example, regarding productivity, we needed a new variety that can uh, have higher yields and also the, type, the size and the quality of the coffee grains, Colombian coffee most, mostly is recognized because has a somehow higher grains, so we need those characteristics in this new variety. And obviously another challenge was that the, the cup profile and the quality of the drink of the coffee made by this new variety was ac accordingly to the, what the world is already used to or accustomed of the taste of the Colombian coffee. Of course also that this new variety can be adapted to the Colombian coffee zone to be grown there and again, that it has to be resistant to coffee rust disease. So we carried out Senecafe, our research center, a lot of uh, experiments and uh, genetic experiments through cell fertilization and selection. I will not, and I don't even know to tell you through the, the details about it, but a very rigorous job, the uh, work, I mean, was carried out by Senecafe in which between that process, uh, fertilizing and having genetic engineering in this case, we came up with the new Castillo variety that was developed by Senecafe and encouraged by the Federation to be used for the coffee growers. So in this case, as you see in this graph, we changed the structure of the coffee plantations in Colombia. Before, some years ago, in the years 1997, only 27% of the coffee trees in Colombia were junk and technified with these uh, uh, new varieties. And that has changed a lot from the figures of 2012. Already more than 76% of the coffee trees in Colombia are junk and are technified. We carried out since 2009-2010 a very strong campaign to renew coffee trees with the new varieties, with Castillo variety, as you can see in the, in the graphs. And it was very, it was a hard job to do because of course coffee growers needed to, to change the coffee that they have. To, of course that affected also production. One of the reasons also for the decrease in production in Colombia was itself the renovation program because they needed to take out some old trees, get new trees, and of course it takes time for the coffee trees to produce more coffee. But anyhow, that campaign was very successful, and as we can see in this graph, out of, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that Colombia has around 900,000 hectares of coffee, and already we have more than half of those hectares already grown uh, with coffee. Uh, that is resistant with new varieties, with Castillo varieties. So we have, in not such a long time, period of time, renew the coffee park, the coffee trees in Colombia. And the results have been very successful. We do, did have a very hard time in the year 2008-2009. We suffered not only, and again the previous speaker, I think that did a very good job explaining the, the impact of, of the rust disease. It, it, it has so many angles regarding what happened with the, uh, with the coffee growers themselves. With they have lower production, they don't have the incentives to invest more. 
We did lose, for example, markets. I, I'm going to share with you, and somehow the, some of the hardest impact was particularly in Japan. Because, of course, with this decrease in production that we had, and also the price, we, we were very unlucky because we had a time that we didn't have coffee in Colombia, production went down, and the price for coffee, not only the, the C price for Arabica coffee, but also the differential of Colombian coffee was really high. So, for example, in Japan, and somehow in other countries, but particularly in Japan, the roasters, they decided to, to switch from Colombian coffee to other origins, particularly Vietnam and Brazil, because, simply speaking, the coffee, Colombian coffee, was not available. So that takes also time. Unfortunately, we have done a very good job, and now Colombian coffee is coming back to higher levels of production and to recover those markets. So coming back again to the fight against Ross disease, as you can see from all year figures, the complete year figures of 2010, in this case, we have an infection of around 27%. And we decreased very sharply only in one year to half of that figure. And right now, only 5% of the coffee trees have the infection of coffee rose disease in Colombia. So let's say that we did suffer a lot. We passed what, for example, Central American friends are passing right now. It was very costly, very hardly. But as everything in life, we learned a lesson, and now we are much better prepared, not only to help ourselves, but also to be able to collaborate with other countries, with Central America and other countries, to share experience of what we have done in Colombia to fight and to control rose disease. And that strategy has been, fortunately, internationally praised as a successful case. So other key message that I think uh, it's important to live in the room. Most of, a large part of that success of this strategy has been that in Colombia, we do have a strong institutions that are, let's say, somehow centralized and all connected to the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation. So that makes things, of course, easier in this case. So I cannot also not share with you some of the highlights to finalize my presentation today of what is going on with Colombian coffee in some other areas. So I will take some minutes to share with you what is going on. Just uh, starting with I just mentioned, the coffee rust disease infection has gone down, in this case to 5% in 2013. The cultivated area also have, has increased up to 15% in the last five years. And we have, as I mentioned before, younger trees. We have, on average, going from a 12.4 average age of the coffee trees in Colombia back in the year 2008 to 8.2 of an average um, age of the trees right now. And production. Uh, Remember the graph that I show after that sharp reduction in 2009 when we almost hit 7 million, we are recovering already to the historical levels. We had to share very good news regarding the recovery of production in Colombia. The last figures and stats that we have from production are the month of October of this year in which we produce more than 1.58 1, million a million of coffee, 60 kilos coffee bags. That is 62% more than the previous year of the previous month of last year. And the accumulated, cumulative uh, production from the last past years from the period of November 2012 to October 2013 was already more than 10 million again. It was 10.3 million. I was checking just yesterday the news in Colombia, so our CEO of the Federation is already predicting that most likely for the calendar year of 2013, Colombia will reach a figure very near or maybe even um, close to 11 million uh, bags of 60 kilo bags of coffee. So that put us again to where we left before we had this crisis that was the coffee rust disease uh, impact on the production in Colombia. 
Again, the, the coffee tree renewal uh, has been very successful. The results are already there. We have younger trees, more production, productivity is also picking up, of course, in Colombia, and more resistant uh, coffee trees in our country. We are, and obviously, there are many challenges to come. The, the weather patterns are changing rapidly every day, but we think, and hopefully it will be the case, that we are better prepared now with these new characteristics of the coffee land in Colombia that I share with you. So most likely we will keep increasing production in Colombia for the years to come. The idea is to go even beyond the historical levels and be able to produce uh, hopefully figures around 13, 14 million bags each year. Also, and this is one of the last messages, of course, it's the interest of the Federation to keep working, encouraging the production and also be involved of the trading and commercialization of value-added coffee. We had also, again, we just saw the figures of the, the price of coffee. We all know what is, how much is the C contract today. So one of the best possible tools that we can have as an, or we can provide as an institution to the coffee growers is to provide them with means and ways to sell value-added coffee. So they will be at least less imp least impacted by the by, by the changes in the coffee price when the price is just when the coffee I mean is sold only as green beans or a standard coffee. So FNC the federation uh, maintains that commitment to uh, commercialize value added coffee and that is, has been the case particularly in, in Asia. So just to finalize, let me share with you that uh, taking into uh, account this important forum and also cafe show, trading show, we took this opportunity to announce, we will do it today, the launching of Juan Valdez coffee shops in Colombia. Maybe some of you know it, we are, are already uh, present in many countries. This is one of the ways, again, to provide the coffee growers with better income. This is a chain, as far as I know, this is the only coffee chain that is directly owned by the coffee growers. The growers are the direct owners of this brand, and it works very well because not only the coffee growers sells premium um, coffee to the company that they own also, so they get in a first stage, they, they get more money for their coffee, but they also own the company and the company pays royalties to the National Coffee Fund for the use of the Juan Valdez name. So again, it's another virtuous cycle in which they can be better off with this, that is their firm expanding in the international markets. We have already stores not only in many countries, most of the countries of Latin America, but also some countries in Europe, the US. Today, it was announced the first opening in Kuwait. So it's amazing to see our coffee grower icon Juan Valdez, not only near the neighborhood in Latin America or even US, but very soon it will be in Korea. So I take this time also to invite you to, to support us and the coffee growers when you will have in the first uh, tri uh, quarter of next year, the opportunity to drink directly the premium coffee brand in Korea. Let me, to finalize, thank again the organizers of this important forum to give me the opportunity to share with you the experiences and challenges of Colombia regarding coffee rose disease. We do have material in Korean language in both in our YouTube and Facebook, Facebook accounts this presentation and the one that I will present tomorrow will be even in Korean language, so please feel free to visit us. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm looking forward to receive any comments or questions. Thank you very much.